Why, hello, fellow sojourners, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. On today's episode, we continue with our discussion on the power of mockery, focusing today on how mockery can shape and influence the culture, and whether Christians should harness that power. I'm Pastor Shane, and I'll be your scoffer today as we appropriate some culture. Alrighty, so last week we were looking at the moral question of mockery. Is it permissible for Christians to mock, to engage in mockery? And as we said, obviously there is mockery that is sinful and plenty of warning in scripture against scoffers, mockers, and the like. We've all seen and probably have been a part of at some point the schoolyard bullying type of mocking that we all know is unchristian. We've all experienced the ways that reckless and demeaning words have hurt us and the ways that our careless words have hurt others. However, we shouldn't oversimplify things. Just because words hurt or cause offense doesn't make them sinful or wrong necessarily. As we said, Jesus says all kinds of things that are offensive. He offended many people. He said critical and biting things to people. His words might have been hurtful, but they were truthful. They were words for the betterment of those who listened, whether they liked hearing it or not. And that is an important thing to understand when we're dealing with the issue of mockery, because so often the reason Christians are squeamish about mockery is because it doesn't seem nice. But as Dr. Thomas would constantly scream at us at Biola, Christ did not die for you so that you could be nice. Niceness is not a fruit of the Spirit. It can be an extension of the fruit of the Spirit flowing from kindness, gentleness, patience, or love. And I certainly don't think that Christians should be incessant jerks, even if I happen to be. And to be clear, there's nothing wrong in itself with being nice. Please do be nice. But it is not, as some Christians seem to think, the paragon of virtue. Niceness is superficial. It's polite and well-mannered and doesn't offend. Kindness is something more, as we see in Psalm 141. Let a righteous man strike me, that is a kindness. Let him rebuke me, that is oil on my head. That's kind, but it's not nice. Now, maybe you think that this is just semantics, and maybe so, but it's semantics with a purpose because we need to be able to differentiate some concepts. Christianity is about more than being polite and well-mannered and inoffensive. And when we make niceness the unassailable virtue, we wind up like the Church of England, who recently at their general synod refused to offer a definition of the word woman. Quote, there is no official definition, which reflects the fact that until fairly recently, definitions of this kind were thought to be self-evident as reflected in the marriage liturgy. That's the natural consequence when you follow the Church of Niceness. You want to be nice. That means inclusive and welcoming and inoffensive. If you start defining woman, well, you're going to hurt someone's feelings. And Christians can't hurt people's feelings. No, it might be nice, but it's not a kindness to lie to people, and it's not loving to lead people away from the truth. We need to be able and willing to speak hard truths. Now, it should be with gentleness and respect, right? Peter says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Now, you could argue, see, we speak harsh truths, righteously strike people with kindness, but mockery isn't gentle or respectful. Hmm. Well, let me play this clip from Elizabeth Warren. In Massachusetts right now, those crisis pregnancy centers that are there to fool people who are looking for pregnancy termination help outnumber true abortion clinics by three to one. We need to shut them down here in Massachusetts and we need to shut them down all around the country. You should not be able to torture a pregnant person like that. Senator Warren is trying to ban crisis pregnancy centers. That's a completely and totally wicked statement, and there are all kinds of harsh truths that I would love to convey about the depths and degree of that depravity, which I could, or I could have the response like the Babylon Bee. Warren condemns Underground Railroad for tricking slaves into escaping. 
It's mocking, it's biting, it's communicating a truth about devaluing human beings. And I would also say it's gentler than a humorless statement would be. The best jokes have truth in them and the truth can cut and the truth can hurt, but they just might be easier to hear in the form of a joke. And it can be far more effective at persuading others. If I were to scold Elizabeth Warren's statement and reprimand its wickedness and vileness, that might be edifying in its truthfulness, but it's probably less winsome and probably less likely to convince people of the rightness of the Christian position than simply mocking her statement. Mocking is still condemning and reprimanding, but it's more palatable and alluring to those who are open to being convinced. We see this very clearly when it comes to the other side. As several years ago, Movie Guide, your Christian guide to all things movie, was talking about the influence of John Stewart and Stephen Colbert and said, the average child in the United States will have spent more than 54,000 hours seeing, hearing, reading, and interacting with various aspects of the mass media from movies and television to video games and internet websites. That compares to only 832 total hours in church if the child goes once a week for one hour every year. Sadly, these statistics strongly indicate that the mass media, not the church, creates the worldview, attitudes, and scripts of behavior for most children and teenagers in America. What the research community has not studied in depth, however, although it has had a tremendous impact on our culture, is the effects of modern satire and humor, especially political satire, in TV programs such as Saturday Night Live, Real Time with Bill Maher, The Daily Show, and The Colbert Report. You can see how dated this article is, but they continue. Young people in particular are easily duped by such humor, so much so that an unscientific online time poll found that comedian Jon Stewart, the host of The Daily Show, is considered a more trusted newscaster than the anchors of the three evening network news programs. One of the most popular segments on The Daily Show was the weekly feature, since discontinued, This Week in God, where one of the show's correspondents delivered a comedic commentary about a few religious news items each week. Although this segment sometimes mocked non-Christian cults such as Scientology, it typically ridiculed religion in general, including the Bible, the Bible's concept of God, Christianity, and Christian leaders. It also sometimes ridiculed the news media's infrequent news reports and discussions concerning religion. So they're seeing how humor and mockery is leading people to align themselves with the comedians when it comes to politics. And they're deeply worried about how the culture will use humor and mockery to lead people away from Christianity. And of course, that's a legitimate threat. As we said last week, part of the reason I tease and mock my own kids is because I want to build them up to be able to withstand mockery. The Bible tells us that we will be mocked. But as we've been saying throughout this entire series, the same tools and methods that our culture uses to lead people away from Christ can be used by us to lead people toward Christ. There's power in humor and mockery, and rather than flee from it in some misguided attempt to be nice, we can use it to speak harsh truths in the culture and change hearts and minds. Now, I'm going to stop there because we have some big news to announce. By the end of August, ATC and TCC are decoupling. TCC will continue with its YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and podcasting channels, but ATC will not be there. Can't imagine why. Your wife is so bald, she looks like Lex Luthor. If Lex Luthor were evil enough to be in an open marriage. 14% of senior pastors surveyed currently struggle with using porn, which is surprising. Doesn't seem that hard to use. Kellogg's introduced their new Pride cereal that invites children to fill out their own pronouns. And as your little tykes chomp down on those extra fruity loops, he, she, they, them, ye, ze, we can turn on Nick Jr. for some blues clues and infotainment. Time for a Pride Parade. Instead, Appropriate the Culture will have its own dedicated YouTube, Instagram, and podcast outlets. If you watch this on Facebook, you can find these videos on my author's Facebook page. And you're going to want to do that because I'm excited to announce that we are making a movie. We've been laying the groundwork for this, constantly beating the drums about the importance of cultural engagement, and this is the early expression of living into that mission and vision. And you are invited to be a part of that. Uh, we have a script, and we are starting the process of pre-production 
connection and putting together a team. If that interests you, or you know someone who that might interest, uh, this is no time to be shy. Uh, please reach out to me. It's a collaborative effort and it takes all kinds. Art directors, set directors, line producers, makeup artists. Uh, currently, we're really focused on adding a cinematographer to the team. And so if you are, or you know some really talented DPs, uh, we need to have a conversation ASAP. You know where to reach me. We'll keep you posted and get you more details as we go along. But in the meantime, we'll be here next week for more Appropriate in the Culture. Yeah.